Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and alcohol coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, alcohol, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hi, everyone. We are back. It is Sarah and I. Hey, Sarah. Hi. So we are going to do something different today, which is not talk about a very specific topic of learning <laughs> like we usually do. Um, we're just, we thought we would come on and talk about female friendships and our own friendship. And the reason we're going to do that is because I, of course, you know, I've been doing this podcast now for, we're at about a year and a half when we record this episode and I pay attention to the episodes and the traffic that the episodes get and what you guys are actually interested in hearing about. And also to the feedback, um, that I get from you regularly when you send me emails or notes, letting me know that you enjoyed an episode. And what's become really clear to me is that there's definitely a real interest in just hearing us talk about meet me and my solo episodes or Sarah and I together, or my sister and I talk about real life stuff. Um, and what is going on in our real lives. And Sarah and I were just before this podcast kind of talking about why that might be that that's so interesting to us, um, which we can talk about in a second, but I also find the same thing happens with me in podcasts. Like I I'm interested in just hearing people have more conversational conversations, <laughs> be more conversational. Uh, I just enjoy that more. It's something that I, I'm, I don't, I, I don't know if it's partly related Sarah to COVID and the fact that we've become so disconnected in the last couple of years. Um, Part, it's partly COVID, but I yeah. also think that, I mean, I've always, as a parent of teenagers, I am always, um, feel very supported by listening to other people's stories of what life is like in their house. Mm -hmm. it, the day-to-day -day, hand to hand combat kind of this mm -hmm. so I can feel normal yeah I, just, I can feel like I have a shared experience because mm -hmm. we're not hanging out on the playground like we did when they were little and we're not uh, and because of COVID we're not doing anything uh well you know we will be soon probably by this podcast release hopefully we'll all be doing yeah. stuff again but yeah. um it's, it's like a a need for a need for connection and understanding and but also when you listen to a podcast you can have an it's interesting i'm just thinking of this now you can have a, like an emotional response to it but you actually don't have to commit energy to the relationship with the people right because we are because sometimes we just don't have time to have a lot of new relationships with people but at the same time, we want to hear their experience. Do you know what I mean? Right, right, right. So listening people, to people yeah. yammer on like you and I on a podcast, mm -hmm. it's like we can share our experience. And whether if that if that um, resonates with somebody, mm -hmm. then um, then it's great. But they don't have to invest in you know taking us out for coffee. That's Although true. It would be really fun to go out for. It would be fun to go out for coffee. And actually today, Sarah, I was thinking, I don't know, the sun's out here today and I was out <sighs> and about, and I got a message from someone in a group I run talking about how they can't wait to meet, meet me in person someday. And I thought it might be retreat season again. Maybe, uh -huh. we can do, maybe we can do a retreat soon, which would be a chance for you to oh come and actually have coffee with Sarah and I, I think it'd be so much fun to put on a day retreat down by the ocean. Um, so uh, keep your ears open because maybe Sarah and I will actually make that happen sometime this spring. I think that would be so great. Oh my gosh. After two Sign years, two years of no retreats, no connection, something that I love doing so much. It'd be so great to put one on again. Um, yeah. So I think for the, both of those reasons, the fact that we have, you know, been in a two year period of very limited forced forced isolation, limited connection. And also as Sarah said, as our kids age, we just spend less time physically with other children's parents. And, you know, for so many of us, certainly this was the case for me when my 
my kids were young and I was in my thirties, most of my friends were my children's friends, mothers. And, um, as that starts to shift, as our kids get older, um, that can lead to a feeling of disconnection. And also just all of the stuff we always talk about this, the burnout thing, like, I mean, the, the piece that is missing for almost every woman that I work with is connection. It's almost always a big piece of the puzzle when we are trying to figure out, okay, what is it that you really need in these moments when you're reaching for a drink or you're reaching for, you know, some food or you're get going back online. And when you don't want to be online anymore, like what is it that you really need in those moments? And it is so often loneliness. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. No, nope, oh, that's all I got. When the, um, <laughs> When I'm talking to people about burnout, they're often talking about not having the energy to even go out and socialize mm -hmm. and how that uh, crosses over with worry about being depressed, right? Yeah. So because, you know, one of the symptoms of depression is social isolation. Yeah. And so, of course, that needs to be separated um, yeah. by a professional, but, but for people who are burnt out, uh, the idea of even getting to that place where you could go to an event or be with friends or it feels like way too much. And yet what you probably need the most is the connection of just like one person, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's often like, I can't go out anymore. Well, out might feel like it drains too many of your resources, like having to be on too much. And so that's where we're talking about sort of more um, forming close personal friendships with one or two people at, as adults mm -hmm. um, is that's actually can create a lot of can add some um, a lot of life back into that idea of connecting with people because it's it's small it's on a smaller scale right well and those yeah those relationships I think are more comfortable like the ones where you know the one you and I have for example which we're going to talk about today and um the the ones that I think of when I think of like really meaningful connection with other women those relationships for me are safer in that it's easy to say I don't have a lot of energy that for this right yeah. now and the person's not going to take it personally because they understand that they know where you are and when you need it and you're ready for it, then you can give it or ask for it. Um, so I think that's the difference between, you know, these social situations where you're going out and it's a bunch of virtual strangers or people that you barely know um, mm -hmm. and don't have that level of connection and intimacy with where it feels like social pressure and it's really hard and exhausting versus, yeah. you know, a meaningful, comfortable, safe friendship with another woman where you can, uh, it could be with a man too. I, I'm not, I don't want to suggest it has to be, I just don't have a lot of really close friendships with men. <laughs> Other than my husband, my, most of my, my good, um, relation friendships are with, are with women. So, um, but I think that, that, that safety piece is, is really for me anyway, is a really important part of what, of a meaningful relationship, a meaningful friendship. I think that even knowing that you don't have to go out and do something with that person mm -hmm. is this form of connection because it reinforces that that sense of safety. Like, I know that this person is out there and I know that we can go for a coffee. I know that we can hang out, that they'll hear me when I speak. But right now I also know that I feel safe enough in my, in our relationship to be able to say, I actually can't do that. But that for, for me feels, um, that feels also energy giving in some way. Cause it's like permission to be okay where I am as opposed yeah. to the idea that I don't have it, I don't have the energy to go out and be with a bunch of people. And so therefore the, the worry about facing criticism around that. Yeah, yeah, which I think you and I have, uh, because we've certainly had times where we've planned to do things and then one of us is backed out because of the fact that we just oh, yeah. don't have, we just don't have the mental stamina to <laughs> deal with each other. <laughs> <laughs> to actually do this, to get out and do the thing yeah. because we're just, we're just worn down. We've had a rough week or whatever. Right. And it's, that's an easy, there's never, I hope there certainly isn't on my end ever any feeling of like, oh, I'm going to disappoint this person, or this is going to be problematic. I know you're going to understand that because that is something that we talk about openly. And uh, it gives me permission to do it myself. It gives me yeah. permission to be okay yeah. with saying, I, I don't have it in me to do this today. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, those are really the, the, 
the only friendships I maintain now are, are friendships that are like that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I kind of know almost instantaneously um, with, if I meet someone, whether or not it's going to be that kind of relationship. It's like my, if, if we, if I meet somebody and we immediately go past the superficial into a meaningful conversation, I know that that's something that will probably stick. And that's my favorite kind of mm -hmm. friendship. It's like just, you know, sometimes you have to get the administrative stuff out of the way and then, you know, right into the interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. But those are, those, are the, those are the only relationships that I really have anymore, which I really enjoy because I know that there is that safety to be able to say, I, you know, I can't be there right now. I can't do this, but there's also, um, the knowledge that that other person feels that way too. Yeah. It's a lot of freedom in that. Yeah. I don't feel a responsibility to, um, be something for my friends that, that I can't be, or that they expect me to be something different than I am. I just am who I am. Right. <laughs> You right. are who you are. That is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we should start with, we've kind of, you know, as you, per usual, we're following no script here. Um, but <laughs> maybe we should start by just telling, letting people know, because there'll be people listening to this podcast who have no idea why you and I are talking about friendships. So Sarah has been a co-host on this podcast, a regular guest co-host now since the podcast began in September of 2020. And we have had lots of very good conversations around women's hormones, burnout, and midlife and the intersection of all of those things. And we've talked about really specific topics and we've talked about more general topics, but what we've never done is talk about just us and our friendship. And so um, maybe we should just explain to people how we met and became friends. I think, I mean, we met when you worked at the clinic for a little bit, but I don't really ever remember seeing you because you were using my office. So I was never there. Yeah, that's right. I, that's actually, right. that's totally true. So I used to work yeah. at the clinic, Sarah's naturopathic clinic, uh, Halifax naturopathic. I used to work there for just a, it was maybe a year. I did that. It wasn't very long, maybe a little longer. I used to support the patients in that clinic with um, nutritional support when I was doing that primarily, which was a long time ago. Um, and I used to go in and it was the Sarah's day off and I would sit in Sarah's office and see clinic patients who'd been referred to me by the naturopaths and other practitioners in the clinic. And, um, so I would only see you if you came in, sometimes you would drop by with your kids who were tiny at the time. Like, I feel like probably your son was still a little baby at that point in time. Probably, yeah, yeah it was a yeah. long time ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, I guess, is when we met, but I was afraid of Sarah because- <laughs> sure. her, Because the walls of her office that I used were covered with plaques that said, Halifax is voted Halifax's best favorite naturopath, <laughs> naturopathic doctor, like all over the wall. Oh my God, that was a like all the years, like year after year after year. I was like, wow, this woman is something. And then you would come in and you'd be no nonsense, like all business, because you had no time because you had these two little kids and you were trying to get <laughs> something done. And you'd be like, bark, you'd be barking out stuff because you knew everybody. <laughs> and Yes, you were barking. And okay. I would just like, I'm like, just kind of in the a hot flash. Yeah, I didn't really know that you even knew who I was, to be perfectly honest. Um, and then I think uh, we, you know, we probably met like a couple times socially through some of the social stuff at the health at the clinic, like Christmas parties or whatever. But we really didn't connect, which is interesting, because I think it probably was that I would have seen you as in a completely different place for me, because my kids were quite a bit older than your kids probably at that time. And I, you know, I don't know, maybe I just thought we don't, it was probably still that point in time in both of our lives where the majority of our friends were the mothers of our children's yeah. friends, right? There's, there's no time for anything else. If you can't hang yeah. out with my, if your kids can't hang out and entertain my kids, we can't do anything together. <laughs> we can't be friends. Like yeah. we can't be friends. There's no time. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Unless yeah. you're an old friend from the past. And then, you know, those are, those friends often get um, ignored for a while, which right. God love them, you know, especially if they don't have children or their children are yeah. at very different stages, then, yeah. uh, you know, they're just kind of like, 
Yeah. Yeah. That's just, it's really hard to manage that. So I think that that's probably what happened. And then, um, Honestly, we, we our paths hardly crossed. I think probably you sent some people my way from your practice and, you know, we had some like professional connections over the, over the years. And then, as I've said many times on this podcast, when I went into um, what I now know was full menopause kind of like very, very rapidly, it was just a very, very, there was no transition involved. I just kind of, as we say, like fell off a cliff with my hormones. Um, in 2020, um, I went to see Sarah because I knew she was the person who might be able to help me. And we sat down and had a really good conversation in whatever time we had, like long appointment, an hour, an hour and a half or something. We sat and talked. And that's when I said, you need to be, I'm going to start a podcast and you need to be my first guest. And I really had been like toying with the idea of a podcast, but hadn't committed to it. But that conversation, I thought this is the conversation that needs to be happening more. And other women need to hear this. And this is the perfect person to have this conversation with. And so then we started doing the podcast together. And through that, we started spending time together before and after podcast recordings. That's really how it started, I think, hey? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. we started it, we started it in the middle of lockdown. Did we not? Yes. Mm-hmm. So yeah. everything was on zoom. Mm-hmm. Uh, we never actually hung out in person except in my, when he came to my office. Um, and I, I mean, I was the, the whole idea of be, doing a podcast was a bit of a horror show for me. Um, yes. I'm fine yeah. with it now, as you can see, <laughs> except for the fact that I have a hot flash every time, <laughs> every time I get embarrassed, but, um, the, uh, yeah. So I mean, your facility with the, with doing things on zoom and all that was a bit intimidating to me. And I mm-hmm. thought you were a bit scary then too. So we were both a little bit scared of each other <laughs> at different times, Yeah. but now my yeah. tech skills scared you. Yes. That's and scary. Your social, media, your social media skills. Oh boy. That's yeah. saying something. That's saying something Look, about your I just skills. sent you something that I tried to make in, in Canva <laughs> to, to advertise the last, you like, I, yeah, it is a bit intimidating your, your ability to, um, to manage the social media world. Anyways, that being said, we, I think we just started hanging out. Well, I guess I must've come to your house the first time or we went out. Oh no, I know we, we went out for Thai food and we started right. planning and planning podcast topics. Right. And then it was just like, we had so many good ideas and we had, we had so many um, shared visions and mm-hmm. that kind of bubbly excitement. And then that sort of translated into hanging out on your couch, watching crappy TV. I don't know where that transition happened, but you know, all of a sudden it was like, Hey, I really like this person. Oh, and your kids are never home. So it's kind of nice for me to come over where there's nobody there. Yeah. My house is like a spa for Sarah because it's quiet. There's no one there. And and my children are like, you know, literally like coming in for four minutes and then leaving again. So um, yeah. And then we started watching uh, our first uh, show that we watched together. That was terrible. Was too hot to handle too hot to handle. Yeah. yeah. Really I mean, bad. That is, it's really, this is, this is, we're very vulnerable here. We're yeah. w- wide open. We watched too hot to handle. Well, you were watching it because you got sick with the vaccine. First vaccine. Yeah, you exactly. So sick, I was, and you watched this yeah. one. Yeah. I'd already started. And then Sarah was immediately into it. I have to say, I was surprised. Uh, I thought, <laughs> I thought appalled, it would be but also- beneath you to watch that. It is beneath that me. Show. But I, I loved the fact that you were into it and then you wanted to keep watching it. And then I think we did then from then on, we just started scheduling things that were social, um, separate and apart from the work stuff, which has been really great. And, and I think, you know, over the last year, our, it's one of those relationships or friendships that has moved at quite a quick pace, I think, in terms of developing, um, some intimacy and, and comfort around sharing things that are happening in our lives that are important. And that's been really amazing. I just feel so lucky to have met you. And it's so funny to me that we were in each other's orbits for so long, but yet not really. (laughs) So that's kind of the story of our friendship. And now we chat regularly and see each other as often as we can, although we both have busy 
busy lives going on. So yeah, that's how it started. I guess, uh, the thing that's, that I really want to emphasize in this is that it was very unexpected. And I had almost gotten to a point where I did not expect to make really good friends anymore. I had this weird notion in my head that like you make your friends and then that's it, you know, and then you get old and they're your friends. Yeah. And what I've learned is that friendships change and that the friendships and relationships that served me in my twenties and thirties are not necessarily the friendships that will serve me in my forties and fifties and onward. And that that is totally okay. And that relationships can work really well and serve you really well at a certain point in your life. And then not at another time in your life. And that is not a reflection on the person or the people in the relationship. It's really a reflection of where you are in your life. And I think one of the reasons why you and I have such a close friendship is because we have so many shared values. Like when I talk to you, it's very comfortable. I mean, you challenge yeah. me and, you know, we have, we don't agree on everything and, you know, that's the way it should be. But I also think that when it comes down to the core values of like what it means to be a good human, you and I are on the same page. And I'm not saying that past friendships and relationships didn't have that, that we didn't share that. I just don't think that was very important to me. It, it wasn't. I don't think we even knew what they were. No. Yeah. That that's point. Like you point. were just kind of like, it was, you were just living your life and learning what your values were, right? Exactly. Stripping, stripping away the things and the people that didn't, didn't uh, elevate you, didn't make you feel, um, uh, or didn't resonate with the way that you yeah. wanted to be in the world. And it's kind of like, um, I, I love the example. There's a, a book called Brainstorming about the teenage brain. And, and I think it's Dan Siegel that wrote it. Anyways, he talks about the teenage brain uh, pruning itself. So it's like getting rid of all the stuff that's not working for them. Right. And that, you know, in those years, you're kind of, you're, you're developing your core values, I think almost. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I feel like those are still developing, but I feel and I, we're going to talk about this on another podcast, but just kind of having crossed into that menopausal zone that there's like more of a sense of self. And with that sense of self comes a sense of what values, um, what values you hold and then what values you're looking for in other people. And it's not necessarily active. It's almost like, as I said, it's like when you get into a values conversation within minutes of meeting each other, something that where you're sharing and you're connecting on that value level, that is, you know, something that, that you know that this person is probably likely to um, be in your coven. Yes. I called it, call it my coven. Yes. When he's part of my coven now. I was so excited when Sarah said I could be part of her coven because when she first told me she had a coven, we weren't really good friends. And I was still kind of like, you know, a little bit starstruck by like the naturopath of the year for 10 years oh, running stop. or whatever she was. <laughs> She hates it when I bring that up. She's so modest. Anyway, um, you told me you had a coven and I was like, oh my God, I want a coven so bad. Like, how do I get into someone's coven? I want to be in Sarah's coven, but I don't think I'm like, I don't think I'm cut out for the coven. Um, You're cut out for the coven. So that was so great when I got into the coven. I felt very, <laughs> so I really felt very good about that. I was just thinking though, when you were talking about that idea of like the teenage brain pruning, um, itself, it's kind of like, you know, our friend, our mutual friend, Jen Sleep Huber says that menopause is like puberty on steroids. Um, and I think that there's another, you know, and she's talking about the hormones and all the stuff, like our periods are like worse than they were when we were 16 and all that stuff. Um, perimenopause, not menopause, but, um, I, I wonder if the same thing kind of thing is happening in our brains and menopause where we're, pr yeah. I feel like I have been pruning. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, I probably pruned as a teenager, got kind of clear on what I, who I wanted to be. Then all these people came into my life that I was responsible for, for 20 years. And my brain got super full again with all kinds of stuff. Um, a lot of it that felt really important at the time, but that wasn't really who I was. It was just what I needed to do and who I needed to be. Yeah. And then when I entered into my you know, mid forties and moved through perimenopause and into menopause, there was a pruning happening in, you know, where I was kind of letting go of the things that no longer needed to be there. But, you know, for a long time, I think we just sit with all of these things and we just assume that they're here to stay 
because they've been there for so long, yeah. but yeah. that awareness and that mindfulness and the calm that comes with, you know, your hormones starting to come down and level out. We've talked about that um, kind of calm or feeling of knowing. I think when that happens, it gives you some space to actually like get a little perspective and look at things and say, okay, hold on. Why am I holding on to all of these things? And why do I feel like these things are still, I still need them or that I still need to be this type of person or do this, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And just slowly start letting go of the things that don't aren't necessary and don't serve you anymore, which is like a pruning, I think. It totally, I, I totally agree with that. In fact, when I was writing the book, I was writing bits about how it's exactly what you were just talking about, how the teenage brain is pruning. And also I think the menopausal brain, perimenopausal brain is pruning. Mm-hmm. And then you end up with that space, as you say, but that space also creates space to invite other women or men, whatever, but mm-hmm. invite other people into your life as friends who are at the same right. place. Right. You know, that are, who've also been pruning and who are also looking for, and maybe not even actively looking. I wasn't actively looking for you as a friend. No, me neither. I wasn't, it was like, I just, it never occurred to me that I would make more or another close friends in my life, like the people who are my besties, you know, the people who've been in the coven, they don't even know they're in the coven. This is the thing is that I have a number of women in a coven. They don't even know they're there. In fact, a lot of them found out at my wedding. <laughs> they oh, were man, they're coming together. But there's... Oh, they don't know. From- we don't know each other. Like, I don't no. actually know any of the other members of the coven, just no. so we're clear on this. It's they're like, I feel coven. like I'm... I'm the only one in the coven. That's what it feels <laughs> like to be in Sarah's coven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, the, um, you know, those are the... Um, I don't know what... Well, I don't even know what I was talking about. But yeah, so there's... So there's I didn't know, it never occurred to me that there would be space in the coven. And I'm just so excited to add people to the coven who, who are, who really resonate me, resonate with me now, because there is a similar, if I look at all the women in the coven who don't know that they're in the coven, I look at all the women in the coven, they all share a similar groundedness and sensibility. They Mm -hmm. have there's a similar, there's a similarity to them that I know that if I put them all in the same room, maybe not for a week, but if I put them all in the same room for a couple of days, mm-hmm. there'd be some magic happening, which is yeah. why I think of it as a coven, because I think of yeah. us all as a bit witchy. And that's interesting too, because I've said that to you before about some of my other good friends. I've said, oh, you'd really, you'd really love mm-hmm. this person. You'd really get along, you know, and that's, again, some of those people are people I've been friends with for a long, long time, um, you know, and in a couple of cases, they're people who happen to start a family at around the same time as I did. So the fact that we were friends before worked really well because we were also transitioning through the same life stages before. So there was none of that awkwardness that sometimes happens there where it feels like someone's doing something different than what you're doing. And that makes it more difficult. Um, didn't have any of that, but then, um, you know, some of them are newer and it's just, it's interesting to me that I don't know that 20 years ago, I would have said, this is a coven. I think you probably did. But for me, my friends, I moved so much and changed like whatever. My friends were all over the place, all different, all served, yeah. like all of my friendships sort of served different purposes. And I had different level, like levels of intimacy with different women. And I'm not sure that it really felt like covenish, if that's a word. Um, but now that this pruning has occurred, which is my new favorite word, by the way, we should count how many times I use it in this podcast. Now that the pruning has occurred, <laughs> all my clients who are listening are like, oh, great. This is oh, going to no. be, we're, now we're going to talk about pruning. <laughs> are you going to do some Instagram post about it? <laughs> now that the pruning has, has happened, I feel like the people who are in my life really are, there's a lot of overlap. They're all very individual, unique people, but they also have a lot of shared overlap and it is in the area of values. And for anyone who's listening, who doesn't know what values are, because there probably are some people who are thinking like, what exactly do we, you mean by values, which is a really good question. Um, and I do a lot of coaching around fulfillment and values with the women that I work with. Um, so this is a word that actually is a really specific meaning for me. Um, I always say values are like your compass. They're the things, you know, and your values are very much your values and not the next person's values. And they're very different from morals. Morals, I think, are more the way we think we should behave. Um, And that has been 
you know, we've been taught that, um, it's a societal standard values are how you need to behave in order to feel authentic and genuine and true. And when you're not behaving in accordance with your values or things are happening around you that are not in accordance with your values, you don't feel good. It doesn't feel right. And so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about values, this idea that those things for me, I have my list of core values. You have your list of core values. There's some intersection there, you know, when the circles intersect, they're not the same. Um, the list isn't exactly the same, but I think there is a fair bit of overlap there. So, um, so I guess the other thing that I wanted to, to do was just kind of explore like what we do together and what we talk about. This sounds so crazy to be talking about this on a podcast, but you know, the, like, what do we do as friends? What are the things that you and I do? Cause I actually work with a lot of women who are unsure of how to even proceed with trying to find a new friend, make a new friend, right. develop a friendship, right? It can feel really, really awkward to do that when you're 50, because it feels like you should have all these things yeah. in place. And it feels, you know, you and I, I think have talked about this before. It's a bit like dating, right? Like you just, you got to try on some people for size to see whether they're a good fit for you. And I think you said it really nicely before when you said like, you kind of know, as soon as it moves from the more surface conversation into a more meaningful topic, you get a pretty good sense of whether there might be some potential there for a friendship, but then what do you do with a friend when you're 50, you know, when you don't have kids, when the kids aren't the primary focus of your life anymore? For me and, and COVID has, I've always, I've always walked, I've always been a walker and I've always had dogs. So, um, and COVID has made this more and more because, um, because we had nothing else to do but go for walks, right? But for me now, what I do with most of my friends at some point is just suggest a walk or be someone that I'm getting to know uh, outside of another situation, for example. Like say I met like my writing coach, for example. Mm -hmm. Love her, love working with her. It was fantastic. And now I'm taking a break from writing. And so now I will text her and say, want to go for a dog walk, right? right? We don't necessarily talk about... We talk about writing, but not necessarily in the way that we were talking about writing when she was coaching me specifically. So, and it, and in that way, it's like the the walking. Um, it it feels more comfortable than sitting having coffee with someone that you don't necessarily know that well on an intimate level mm -hmm. right yet. Right? It's like because because you've got things to look at and you're moving your bodies and there's fresh air and so for me, walking is a big part of getting to know people because. Converse, I find conversation really evolves when you're moving. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And as you were talking, I was just thinking, you know, if we all just took the step and asked one person who we kind of like to go for a walk with us, mm -hmm. we would start increasing our circles, you know, exponentially, I think. And it's, we're afraid to do that. But like, if there's someone, cause it, it's always awkward in the beginning, like whatever the first time was that I asked you, if you wanted to come over and I don't know what I wouldn't have said, come over and watch trash TV. I definitely wouldn't have phrased it that way. I would have sucked you in with something more cerebral. Something better, yeah. <laughs> and then pulled the rug out from under you and said, guess what we're watching? Um, uh, but, you know, if you like in the beginning, it can feel a little awkward with that invitation. But what I like to remind people of is that Sarah and I were both feeling like we had room in our lives for more connection. And I think most women feel that way. Most women feel like this has waned over the years for us and the years of being super duper busy. Um, you know, and, um, for many of us, the years of being responsible for other people, for our children. Right. And so there's a pretty good chance that whoever you're going to ask is actually going to be really excited about the possibility of building a relationship with another woman. Honestly, like, you know, if there's someone at your gym class who you just get it, good, have a good connection with, and you, you know, have a laugh with like, maybe that I love the idea of the walk. I think it's like the safest first date <laughs> for friends. Um, maybe ask if they like to walk or if they have a dog and they want to go for a walk, a walk with you. Um, I think we did, you and I did that. Well, we've done that many times. We still do that because it's also great for your brain and for your body to go for a walk. So that's nice. We, we we love to multitask. <laughs> So, um, uh, but then we've done, again, we, we'll just get together and, and hang out and it's very 
it's very relaxed. Like Sarah, I will say, would you like to hang out on Thursday night? And Sarah will say yes. And then she will show up whenever she damn well pleases. So how you roll. Never Pretty really know. It. Because yeah. it, it depends how things go at home with her and her kids. Her kids are younger than mine. And so it depends what's going on in her life. But she might text and say, I'm not going to get there till 630. Or she might text and say, I can get out early. Can I come? Like, what are you doing now? Can I come now? Do you want to eat together? So it's pretty, it's pretty chill and relaxed. But, um, and then, then we worked our way up to like actually doing um, sleepovers, <laughs> which are fun. <laughs> We've only had a couple, but they've been fun. They're fun. Yeah. <laughs> where we actually get away for yeah. like a night and, and just like get to hang out and talk. And sometimes actually almost every time, Sarah, we have great intentions of watching trash TV and then we never get to it because we start talking and that's mm-hmm. way more fulfilling than watching trash TV. Um, however, there is season two of too hot to handle <laughs> has now dropped. <laughs> so you never know. Maybe you we'll never know. know. Never know. Yeah. I find, I, th- I find that what we do is we, and I do this with all my other friends too, um, is every time we meet, whether it's once a week, I have a friend we try, try and meet once a week or once every two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's that we have to like, it's, it's like you have to kind of barf out all the barf out all the, this is happening in my immediate world right now. You know, whether it's, yeah. I've got 17 different appointments with the dog, the, the vet and the kids at the dentist and the, this and the, that and that. And just like, there has to be a good 20 minutes of that in mm-hmm. order to like, cause that's what you're holding. This is what you're holding all day as a manager of a family, you know, yeah. or as a, as a, um, as a colleague with a bunch of people or as a manager of people, or as a, you know, you're holding the stuff that is just top of mind. And it's like, that stuff has to be released. And, you know, I mean, you tell your, if you've got a partner, you might tell your partner at home, or you might tell your mom over the phone, but there's something about sitting face to face with someone and just like, <sighs> just like letting it all out. And then there's like a, a, a space to breathe. And then it's like, okay, how are things really for you? Right. Yeah. Like, and so it's almost, it's almost cleansing in some way, you know, it's just like, okay, we little, you have to get this out and then we, and then we can get to the, to the meat. Yeah. I totally agree. Which is why I like the sleepovers. Cause that leaves lots of time oh, yeah. for, the, bar- for time. the barfing and then for the subsequent conversation. <laughs> Yeah. But if you only get to the, if you only get to the, like, I don't want to keep using the word barf. No, please find another word. <laughs> yeah. You only get to the, um, uh, I can't even think now because that's all I've got in my head. Uh, the, the dumping, the, call it dumping, the, the dumping, the dumping of this, the, the stuff that's on your mind right now. If you only get to that and then you, and then you have to go, like if you don't sort of yeah. create enough space for more than that, yeah. then then you you never kind of get into the into the meat right and so that's texting is good for that sometimes um you know and and i think actually that's been helpful for some women's relationships i know one of the best times you and i ever had was actually on text at the beginning when yeah. we were trying to come up with the wtf we were oh, the coming, name. Up, coming up for that it's because we were like in our separate houses not talking just texting back funny names and then you know just basically like doubled over laughing at some yeah, of the yeah, ideas that, that we come up with and so you know, text, texting does help with with that sort of yeah. release yeah. it's like it's not a barfing it's release it's just yeah. release of all this stuff that's like yeah. oh my god all these things happened today and I just need to say them out loud right? and I often find that there's just naturally kind of an ebb and flow of that in that there's always one person who needs that more than the other person. That's, yeah. that's how I, f- I find it with my friendships. Like when I call someone, there's, it's like, you just naturally step back for the person who needs that more. And I think in a good friendship, you can, you can feel read that. Yeah. yeah. And read it. And I think that's certainly play plays out with us. Sometimes it's you that needs to do the dumping. And sometimes it's me that needs to do the dumping. And I think we just kind of get that you, we start off with some of the, you know, more surface level stuff. And it becomes pretty obvious who's got, who's got the stuff going on that needs to get dumped. And then that happens like, which I think is a sign of a good friendship too, when you can, you know, just when you're sensitive to that and aware of that. And, and when that's naturally happening. Um, And then when there's no like 
resentment or any, like there's no, there's no attachment to how it goes. Like there's no expectation for me as to how it's going to go. And there's no attachment in terms of an outcome or, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I was thinking about that the other day about how it's a friend of mine texted to me and texted me after a walk that we'd had together. And she said, I like the fact that it's always like no BS with you. And like, it's just, I, don't know, I am who I am, I guess. And I'm just like, and, and I just said, it'd be too, it's too much work. Honestly, it's too much work to be something other than this. And I mm-hmm. think that that's another part of that menopausal thing. Like, I think I've been like this for a long time now. I think I found that about myself early, but mm-hmm. I don't have any insecurity about it anymore. And mm-hmm. um, which I think is also part of that, like going into menopause. It's just like, I, I was, this is, I'm not apologetic at all for this personality. It just is what it is. Um, but I think that there, I think that it took a lot more work to um in friendships perhaps in 20s and 30s maybe early 40s a lot more work because you didn't know or I didn't know exactly who I was and so therefore I thought it might have had to be a certain way with people and it's and so therefore there was perhaps except with some very you know the 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 women who stayed in the coven I guess it just was like it just, there just felt like there was a little bit more effort to maintain something that wasn't necessarily a hundred percent organic. And I yeah. feel like in the postmenopausal world or the perimenopausal world, when all the pruning's happening, like there's a real opportunity to just be your organic self and then to let the people come. <laughs> it's like build it and they will come, and right? It's like, come. Yeah. And, and if you're creating that space and you're, and, and you're like, I hate using the word authentic self because it's so overdone. But if you're really like in touch with that, with the, if you're really just who you are, then the, the, you will find each other. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, COVID's that. been hard yeah. for sure, but you will, you will yeah. find each other. And that like you and I found each other and, and I made another friend. Um, it was through kids, but I made another friend during COVID or before, just before COVID when I thought, wow, like, it's really cool. I really like you. You know, I, I really like the, your sensibility, the way you are in this world. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, it was almost embarrassing, like to, to text back and forth and say, I really like it. you. Yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. Want to hang out? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But, no. it, but I, it wasn't, um, it was slightly embarrassing, but I wouldn't have done that in my 30s. You yeah. know, it was more like, I really like you. I feel like we have a connection and let's just explore this more, even though it feels weird. Yeah. I had the same experience with this woman. I told you, I've told you about it. And I think I might've mentioned it on a podcast in the very early days um, of the podcast, but I had a similar experience with my friend, Erin, who may or may not listen to this episode. She's not much of a podcast listener, but that's okay. I still love her. Um, But I met her at, I was doing a coaching certification and I met her in one of my courses and she actually came up to me on a break or something and said, we were probably like, we're like 30 people in the, in the class. And we'd been sitting in like kind of a circle shape, um, for the morning. And she came up to me on the break and said, this is going to sound really weird, but I feel like I'm supposed to get to know you better. And I was like, this chick is nuts. Like, that's the first thought that went through my mind. Like what? Um, because I would never have had the confidence to do that. Like that just would never have crossed my mind to do that. And so I thought, well, she must be crazy. Um, but guess what? She wasn't crazy at all. And I ended up, you know, walking to lunch with her on the lunch break and eating with her. And she is just the most fantastic person. And we had the same thing, just a very instantaneous feeling of total comfort with each other. Mm -hmm. And like, we were meant to so much so that by the end of that weekend, she drove me to the airport and this was in Toronto that I met her and she drove me to the airport. Um, she lives in Guelph and on the way to the airport, she said, uh, are you, when are you doing the next class? There were these five, five weekends that we had to do for this course. And we were in the same course and she said, well, and I said, yeah, I'll probably just do an Airbnb again. That's where I was, you know, I'd rented an Airbnb. And she said, no, come and stay with me. What are you talking about? And I said, oh, wow. Well, that's really generous. You know, and I got on the plane and I said, okay, well, I'll be in touch. And I thought, I can't go stay with her. I, I've known her for two days. This is nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I did end up going and I stayed with her and I met her husband and her kids. And we had the most wonderful weekend, commuted back and forth to the course together, became just such good friends in that second weekend. And, you know, I don't see her very often, but when I do, it's like we, it's like we were just together, you know, a couple of days before. And I think I, that was a really surprising thing for me. I was very surprised that that could still happen. And it was exciting because it feels like, you know, it can feel like there aren't any surprises left. And that's true. You know, we build up, I think we build our, our years up as particularly as mothers, like we just build those years up as like the best years, you know, now I'm getting all teary because my kids are, I'm, my kids are leaving this year, but I, I definitely felt that way. Like these have to be the best years. Right. And there probably isn't much left to look forward to. That sounds really depressing, but you know, there isn't much surprising that's going to happen to me as I go forward in life. And the female friendships that I've made in the last few years have been really wonderful surprises and they wouldn't, neither one of them would have happened if the, if me and the other person hadn't been willing to go out a little bit on a limb and take a little bit of a risk. True. And so, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast was just to encourage anyone who's listening, who's feeling a little lonely and disconnected. And by the way, we all are Mm -hmm. like, if you're feeling that way, like, so are all the other women. Yeah. Um, to just take a little risk, just push yourself a little bit out of the comfort zone here, because it's really been like, truly like becoming friends with you, Sarah, has been really, really meaningful to me. It's been so wonderful. I've had so much fun with you and I did not expect it at all. Mm -hmm. When I asked you to be on the, on the podcast, I just, it it wasn't, I was just a professional thing. Like, okay, this would be a great little working thing to do together. Like didn't cross my mind. And, and same thing with, you know, Aaron, um, who was, I met right before COVID just also didn't go to that certification thinking I was going to make a, you know, a a new good friend, like that's, it was not on the agenda. So you have to get stuff out there. I feel like it's, um, yeah, it's given me hope that I didn't know I needed Right. You know, That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah it's like, yeah. I, because I'm just living my life. And as I've said, like hand to hand combat with, you know, having young teenagers in my house yeah. and, um, trying to get through every day and keep my marriage alive and do all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's just a, it's, it's just hope. It's like hopeful and knowing that there's the, first of all, also like, this is might sound a bit weird, but that like, I'm still valuable as a friend, right? Like I personally, that I have friends and I know they love me and whatever, but that somebody else can love me as a friend and that I can love someone else, right? That there's, that there's, it's a new layer of loving somebody really, you know, it's a, which is really hopeful. It's Mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. So especially when you're kind of the last couple of years have been so hard and you're kind of mired in the sameness of your every day. Mm-hmm. And not a lot of potential for um, growth in COVID, frankly, other than like, oh my God, we made this, made it through this. Right. Um, but, you know, the kind of the sameness of every day and that there's, and the sameness maybe of relationships and which it's all good because that sameness for me, at least was stability and grounding and, and support for, you know, making it through all this, but to know that there's, um, that there's that, the new friendships and, and, uh, new loves Mm -hmm. are out there, new possibility of people to love. And like, if, if we each made two really good friends in the last couple of years, then what's to say we can't keep making good friends as we continue on through our life. Um, although you and I have talked about the fact that we feel like we need less people. (laughs) then maybe we did, which is an interesting kind of shift where when I was young, it was all about like how many people I had. And now that is just not important to me at all. It's about quality for sure over quantity. Um, And I just want to go back to before we wrap this up, because I feel like we've narcissistically talked about our own relationship for long enough now. (laughs) Why would you want to go back to something you just said, which I loved, which was that it is so hard to be somebody other than yourself and how much energy we put into being somebody other than the person that we actually just organically are 
and who it is the most efficient to be. Yeah. It makes yeah, sense. It's efficient. Like, it's totally. It's the smoothest, easiest ride to just be yeah. yourself. And it's interesting because when I'm coaching around values, I talk about this idea of like your, your, if you imagine yourself as kind of a ship in a, in a, in a river, um, when you're in, when you're moving in alignment with your values, you're being taken by the current of the river. And it's, a, it is a smooth, easy trip through life. But when you're, values are in jeopardy or not don't have space to be expressed um or are being completely trampled on in whatever circumstances or relationships you're in it's like your boat is just banging up against the shore going back and forth and and it's a really it's a really hard inefficient way to yeah. go through life. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting. I've never really thought of that. Maybe I'll put that on Instagram, but it is, <laughs> it is, it is really, I think it is really such a simple way of saying that. Like it's so much easier to just be yourself and we're just making it so much harder on ourselves by trying to be somebody that we're not all the time. And this probably sounds super trite, but I'm having some kind of a weird epiphany around this. Um, so I feel like I need to work it through on a live podcast Go for it. Like yeah, We're all supporting you. We are the coven. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, but the, um, go ahead. The, you have something. The, I'm just thinking about that efficiency and, and how, um, with, if you are, if you are in alignment with your values and if someone else is in alignment with their values and they're having an easy stream of it and, your values cross over, then mm-hmm. your two like rivers eventually mm. could merge. Ooh, right? This is getting super deep. Nice. <laughs> I see an infographic coming. Oh dear. <laughs> or a stock photo of a river. Um, but yeah, so and and then it then the friendships are easy and they're supportive yeah. and they're yeah. and and that's that's I think what we're all kind of looking for is that yeah. ease. And so yeah. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. There was something else I wanted to say, but now I can't remember. Um, it had to do with that. It'll come. That's okay. It'll, it may come back to you. It may not. It'll come back in a future episode. Oh, oh, I know what it was. There you go. If you, if you are thinking that it would, that you would like to find some more people in your life that resonate with you, take a look at the friendships that you do have and the people who, whom you resonate most with, the people who it's easiest with. And chances are that they're, the shared values there are similar to what you're looking for in other people. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Yeah, yeah so, that's a really good starting place. I agree with that. Yeah, it's just like, look at the friendships that actually feel buoyant to you, that mm-hmm. support you and feel safe and easy and um not a lot of work honestly friendships should not be work they really shouldn't be and i think it's actually it's you know you know my favorite words are uh does this serve me those are my favorite four words <laughs> i think they should be the guiding mantra of every woman in midlife does this serve me and i think it is totally okay and in fact a really good practice to apply that to the relationships in your life does this serve me And I think it's, as I said, at the beginning of this podcast, it's possible for a relationship to serve you for a period of time in your life and then no longer serve you. And it is okay to say goodbye or to change the nature of that relationship to one that serves you better um, as you go through, because I think we hold on to a lot of these things thinking that we need to, right? Again, this is an example of not being ourselves, being somebody else and holding on to these things, feeling like somehow it's a failure if this relationship doesn't make it until our deathbeds. Yeah. But I don't think that's how it's meant to be. And I think, you know, relationships come and go and change and evolve over the course of our lifetimes. And as you and I are talking about, it's totally possible to develop brand new relationships that are actually really meaningful at the age of 50. Yeah. And so hopefully this has given you some hope. And I hope that you go out and just ask one person out on a date, a friend date um, after this podcast and see where that takes you. Because if you don't do that, you'll, you won't get there. It's you, you got to take a little leap of faith and go for a walk um, or go have a coffee 
um, because you just never know. You just never know what's going to come of it. And we wanted to to just really celebrate that discovery that the two of us have had mutually had with each other, but also with other people in the last couple of years and, and something that we did not expect to have happen. Do you have anything else you would like to say, Sarah? Or should we wrap it up? No, I think we've talked about it ourselves enough. I think we have to. There we go. They're probably tired of us now. Yeah. Thank you for bearing with us today. Hopefully that you uh, you took something from that that's useful that you can that you can use in your own life. And we will be back next time. We promise we'll talk about something other than ourselves. Um, and uh, that's it. Have a great day, everybody. That never actually fully happens with It you. doesn't really. I know. <laughs> I want to say it. We'll we, try. We'll do our we best. Try. Yeah. Okay. See you, Sarah. Bye. You've been listening to Bite Size Balance with your host, Wendy McCallum. As a burnout and balance coach, I help busy, high achievers like you create a more balanced, joyful life. If you've been putting yourself last for way too long and are worried that you're burning out, grab your free burnout checklist at www.wendymccallum.com forward slash checklist. That's www.wendymccallum.com forward slash checklist.